research later that it was unsafe to eat. Um, you know, I remember being just so sad when my dad told me that our family tradition of going into the woods and getting and gathering wild mushrooms was basically going to have to stop for the next 25 years because mushrooms in particular bind the radioactive isotopes. Um, in fact, wild boars, which are actually quite common in Germany, um, root mushrooms out of the ground. And um, just last year, a study was done that showed that one in three wild boars in Germany, which is you know, historically a food source for the country, is so contaminated with radioactivity that they have to be disposed of as hazardous waste rather than being food. So, um, you know, perhaps justifiably, my mom was just pretty nervous about raising kids in an environment where the food in your backyard was unsafe to eat. And so um, the kind of free spirit that she was, my mom flipped a coin. And if it was heads, we were going to move to the United States. And if it was tails, we were going to uh, relocate to New Zealand. So the coin came up heads, here I am. Um, we ended up settling in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, and we bought 100 acres um, in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. You know, just totally gorgeous country. This is the pond that's on our property, and so I spent, you know, the rest of my childhood swimming in this pond and scrambling up rhododendron thickets with my brother and our friends. But this idea that we as humans can have an outsized impact on the environment really stayed with me. And I knew that I wanted to do something to protect the planet. I just didn't quite know how. Um, so when I came to Tufts, I majored in biology and environmental studies. I spent a lot of time on the third floor of Dana Hall in the lab of Dr. Sarah Lewis, um, doing work on you know, evolutionary biology and ecology, really drank up um, the lectures. Um, and then I also spent a bunch of time on the Frisbee field, um, was the captain of the Tufts Ultimate Team for four years. Um, and my senior year rolled around, and, you know, in addition to trying to figure out how to get the EWO to do better than our quarterfinals, finish at nationals the year before, I was also trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. Um, raise your hand if you're a senior. Awesome. You might be in this position right now, like, what am I going to do? Um, so... You know, I was trying to decide, do I do grad school and environmental, you know, some kind of environmental field? Do I do biology? Do I do evolution? Or is there some other avenue? And um, in 2001, which is when I was a senior, uh, something happened that basically charted my path into the future. Um, so in 2001, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released their third assessment report. Raise your hand if you know what the IPCC is. Awesome. Gentleman in the black hat. What is the IPCC? Exactly. The report is a huge document outlining the data about climate change. What is the panel itself? Anybody know? Okay. So the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is actually a um, body that's set up by the United Nations to study climate change, and it compiles research of literally thousands of scientists worldwide from all different countries. And in this third assessment released in 2001, um, more conclusively than ever before, this body said that global warming is happening. Um, it's happening because of human-induced emissions, and we have to act boldly and swiftly to avert um, the worst impacts of global warming. So as a kind of scientist, I saw this report, I read about it, and perhaps naively thought, this is it. Now our national political leadership is going to take the reins, we're going to get on board with the Kyoto Protocol, um, we're going to ramp up energy efficiency and clean energy, this is the defining document, action is going to happen. Unfortunately, and this may not come as a shock to you, but it actually came as a shock to me my senior year. Science alone doesn't drive decision-making in our country, even though maybe it should. Decision-making in our country is actually driven primarily by power. And power is determined by who has money, who has access, and who has influence. And in 2001, the top elected officials in our country were George W. Bush and Dick Cheney. And these gentlemen had long and historic and deep ties 
to the fossil fuel industry in our country. And so two weeks after being elected, um, the Bush administration formed an energy task force. And the purpose of that task force was to chart an energy future for our country. On the task force were representatives from the nuclear industry, the oil industry, the natural gas industry, the utility companies. Not a single representative from the environmental community was on the task force. Not a single scientist was on the task force. In fact, the proceedings of the task force were kept secret from the public, and the Government Accountability Office actually had to sue in order to get records to the meetings. Ultimately, the task force findings were that we needed to build 150 new coal-fired power plants in this country. So as somebody who's sitting, you know, kind of in the ivory tower trying to figure out what my own personal future is going to be, you know, I saw it as I could continue a path of science, contributing to the body of knowledge that helped lead to documents like the IPCC report. But I actually realized that more importantly, I want to make sure that that excellent body of science that's out there actually gets paid attention to by our decision makers. And the gap there was building political will. So I became really interested in how do you actually build political will in a way that is strategic and wins real victories. Um, I had never been an activist on campus. Um, you know, for better or worse, but all of a sudden I was like, all right, how do you actually do this in a way that's strategic and makes a difference? Um, so the only job I applied to out of college was Green Corps, and I got into the program, so that's what I did. Um, I did a year-long fellowship with Green Corps, the field school for environmental organizing, then became a community organizer with Toxics Action Center, um, then an Took a break from organizing for a while, trying to figure out if this is actually what I wanted to do, um, but came back and was uh, the advocate and then state director with Maryland Perg. Now, I feel like um, while I was at Maryland Perg, I really kind of came into my own doing this work. Um, the very first campaign I ran was to try to ban smoking in restaurants and bars in Maryland. It's kind of a shocking experience to move from Boston to Maryland and want to go out and get a drink and you know, coming home smelling like an ashtray. So it was very much kind of personally motivated. Um, but uh, I successfully kind of ran the campaign and drove the strategy to make Maryland the 17th smoke-free state. Um, two years later, won some of the strongest energy efficiency standards in the country at the state level uh, when uh, we helped pass the Empower Maryland Act and then um, helped stop the construction of a new nuclear reactor on the shores of the Chesapeake Bay. So I feel really proud about the work that I did in Maryland. And then um, my husband uh, joined the faculty at UMass out in Amherst, uh, and he's from that part of the country, and we were both excited about coming back to New England. So now I work with Environment Massachusetts and our national federation, Environment America. Just a little bit of background about Environment America. So we are um, a national federation made up of 29 state-based groups and also a, a lobbying office in Washington, D.C. Um, we're part of a larger family of organizations that works for the public interest called the Public Interest Network. And our basic approach is we do research, advocacy, and grassroots organizing to win victories for the environment. Um, we definitely don't work in a bubble. There are a lot of really great environmental organizations out there that all kind of fill a unique and important niche. So these are just, you know, some of the other groups that are out there and, you know, at the level here, we also have the Conservation Law Foundation and the Environmental League of Massachusetts. And each of these organizations, you know, has kind of its own constituency and its own approach to solving environmental problems. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about kind of what makes environment, like why I choose to work for Environment America. So the first reason is um, I actually just identify pretty deeply with our mission. Um, the mission of Environment America and Environment Massachusetts is to protect the places that we love and to champion our core environmental values. So for me, that means we're working to protect, you know, places like the Charles River and the beautiful beaches on Cape Cod. Um, we're protecting the just stunning majesty of the Berkshires um, and all the places in between. At the same time, we're also tackling tough problems of our time, like global warming, and we're seizing opportunities to move forward a cleaner future, like investing in solar energy, for example. Um, on any of these issues, whether it's land conservation or moving forward a renewable um, energy future, 
or curbing emissions, there is an entrenched and powerful opposition that is basically working against that agenda. Um, so, you know, if you're looking to protect open space, inevitably you'll come up against the developers. If you're looking to move forward, you know, investments and incentives for clean energy, you're going to run into the American um, Petroleum Institute. Um, if you're trying to make it so that toxic chemicals are, I don't know, reduced in plastics, you're going to run into the American Chemistry Council. And these um, industries are incredibly powerful. Um, over the past 40 years, they've become increasingly savvy in um, how they run campaigns. They're spending more and more of their resources doing lobbying and advocacy to defend their interests. Um, and so, you know, one question that I often get asked is like, Johanna, how do you possibly go about accomplishing your mission in the face of opposition like this? And um, the way we do it is basically uh, a medley of strategies. So the first thing we do is research. Um, so on the left here is a copy of the cover of one of our recent research reports entitled America's Dirtiest Power Plants. Um, and this is one, uh, just one of dozens of reports that we've released. I forgot them in the career services office, but maybe I'll run back and get them and bring them out. But I brought like 15 of our recent research reports on our global warming uh, work. And these reports basically document the problems and the solutions around an issue. And um, they do it in layman's terms so that, you know, basically a person who's comfortable reading a newspaper could pick up our research report and read it. Um, it, in that sense, it's really different from kind of the base scientific research um, that we might do here. You know, there's not a method section and it's not technical jargon. We try to really make it for um, the informed public and the media. And then generally we'll release our reports um, through a media strategy. So we'll organize news conferences, standing together with other important um, stakeholders um, whose voices may be more credible to the decision maker than we might be. So that's the first thing we do is research. We document the problems. The second thing we do is um, we advocate for those solutions. So um, this is our field organizer down at Environment Texas who earlier this week testified in support of a solar resolution in the city of Austin. Um, she just graduated college. Totally cool that she's doing that work and they won the vote 10 to 1 later on that night. Um, so the advocacy is the second part. You know, we'll testify at hearings. We'll meet with members of Congress. Um, and sometimes that's enough. Sometimes just documenting the problems and doing the research and advocating is enough. But most of the time, um, more is needed because the political power of the opposition is just quite strong. And so that's where our grassroots organizing comes in. We, in all of our work, really give everybody that we come in contact to from all different walks of life meaningful opportunities to get involved. And that might mean participating in a march to demand action on global warming or submitting public comments um, in support of rules and regulations to protect our environment. Um, it might mean that we're, you know, reaching out to small business owners or local elected officials, urging them to sign on to our campaign. Um, and the exact strategy of our grassroots outreach is really determined by who the decision maker is and what we think is going to move them. Oop. So the things that make us unique and kind of the second reason why I really like working for Environment America and Environment Massachusetts is that um, we're really strategic. So what I mean by that is we, we really have a vision for what the world can be. And we think long and hard about what we can realistically push for now that will move us closer to that vision. So an example of this, um, I'll go back to my work to make Maryland smoke free. When um, I came, walked into my first coalition meeting of the smoke free Maryland coalition, there were a lot of really great groups around the table. The American Heart Association was there, the American Cancer Society was there. Um, and we all agreed that in order to win at the state level, we needed to pass smoke free in the city of Baltimore. If we succeeded that, more than 50% of the state would be covered by smoke-free laws. It would kind of tip the scales and we'd win at the statewide level. So as people are going around and reporting their action plans, I remember one of the coalition part was partners saying that they're going to do educational workshops in Western Maryland. And in my head, I was like, wait, 
that's two miles or two hours west of Baltimore. If we know that the key to winning Baltimore City is, or that Baltimore City is the key to winning statewide legislation, why are we doing educational workshops out there? And I ended up, you know, kind of helping shape our strategy and we ended up winning at the uh, city council level and then winning at the statewide level. Anyway, so we're strategic. Um, the second thing is we just don't give up. So when we set, when we decide to work on an issue and we come up with a game plan for working on that issue, um, we hold ourselves accountable to that game plan. We hold ourselves accountable to the goals that we've set. And, um, and sometimes we win, but if we don't win, then we reevaluate our plan and we figure out some other way to do it. And I'll talk more about this and give an example um, when I go through our work on global warming. Which brings me to the issue of global warming. Um, you know, this is arguably the most pressing and important environmental issue facing our planet and certainly our generation today. So I want to spend a little bit of time articulating the problem, talking about the solution and the timeline needed for action, and then lay out a progression of policies um, that we've helped put in place um, that you know certainly more needs to be done, uh, but a lot of great work has been done. Um, and I'll be so intrigued to hear how much of this is old hat to you um, and like rehashing what you already know versus new information. So be intrigued to get that feedback. All right, so the problem, um, I think we all know that our planet is warming. So 2014 was the hottest year on record. 2015 is on track to being the hottest year again. 14 of the 15 hottest years have happened this decade. Um, it's just indisputable that our planet is getting warmer. And the colors here on the projector aren't terrific, but this is a graphic from the National Oceanographic um, and Atmospheric Agency's Center for Environmental Information. And um, it's the time period from June through August of 2015, so the most recent block of time. And the dark red um, here correlates to times when um, record setting temperatures have been set for that region. Um, and so you can see that basically we are seeing record setting temperatures all over the globe for this time period. And there's really only one small region in the North Atlantic um, where we're seeing co uh, cooler than average temperatures. So there's no doubt that the planet is warming. Um, there's also no doubt that it's human activity that's driving this warming. Um, in, their most, in the fourth assessment of the IPCC, um, these scientists expressed greater than 90% certainty, and in their fifth assessment, it's actually 95% certainty that um, human emissions are causing this. Um, and there are a number of different ways that they can prove that. One is the fingerprint on carbon dioxide. Another one is, you know, if you just look at all the natural changes alone, it doesn't explain the warming. There's actually, you know, expanding um, lower atmosphere that, anyway. If you're curious, the Union of Concerned Scientists has a great slide on how you explain that human activity is causing the warming, um, and the IPCC does too. So I'm not going to go into that in huge detail here. But the impacts of this warming um, are something that I think when I was in college, it was a little bit like we're going to see this happening someday. And for you all sitting here 15 years later, you're seeing the impacts now. Um, you know, when I was driving to Boston last night, I was on the phone with my mom, who still lives in Floyd County, Virginia. And she was saying that for the first time ever, because of the flooding, both of the major arteries that come into town were flooded. And, you know, people were stranded trying to get home. It's never happened in Floyd. Um, and I'm sure the people in Texas feel the same way when their interstates were flooded. Um, people in Boston felt the same way um, when essentially the entire city was shut down in February of last year. Um, and anybody who, you know, lives in a coastal region and feels the increasing brunt of stronger, more frequent um, storms. Um, there's no doubt that we're seeing more extreme weather, and these types of extreme weather events are consistent with what scientists predict would happen in a warming climate. Um, we're also seeing a lot more wildfires and drought. Um, you know, there's one fire chief in Elkton, Colorado, who went on record to say that global warming has literally changed his life. And it's because the fire season is starting earlier, 
the fires are burning hotter and are a lot more unpredictable and the season is lasting longer. And it's all because the fuel is like a tinderbox. Um, you know, there was recently a wildfire in Washington state in an area that normally gets 140 inches of rainfall. I mean, it's effectively a temperate rainforest and we're seeing wildfires there because high temperatures. Um, and then you've seen just California, you know, stricken with a record setting drought that is, you know, really affecting our whole nation's agricultural um, supply. Again, wildfires and drought predicted under a warming climate. Sea level rise is accelerating. Um, today, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and Miami, Florida routinely flooded high tide because of sea level rise. Um, NASA basically says that with the carbon emissions we've already put into the atmosphere, we are locked into at least three feet of sea level rise, likely more. And in the United States alone, five million people live within a four foot sea level rise. Um, there are these cool models. Um, if you, you know, Google sea level rise Boston, the Boston Globe actually has these uh, really interesting images where they've modeled what, um, you can like click on what level of sea level rise you're interested in seeing different Boston landmarks at. So it like shows the Boston Harbor Hotel, you know, with water up to here, or, um, you know, what does Harvard Yard look like um, at 20 feet of sea level rise, et cetera. It's interesting. And then um, a last impact of global warming, and one that I find um, among the most disturbing, is that our oceans are acidifying. So, um, you know, our oceans absorb some of the excess carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere. And surface ocean is now 30% more acidic than it was in pre-industrial times. Um, that's the biggest change in ocean chemistry in 5 million years. And the problem is that a lot of ocean organisms um, have calcium carbonate exoskeletons or skeletons. Um, what happens when you put calcium carbonate in acid? What's it? Yeah, it dissolves, exactly, it dissolves. Um, so these images are of a pteropod shell that was, um, these are courtesy of the National Geographic Society, uh, but it's a lab experiment when they put a pteropod shell in um, acidic ocean water, and within 45 days, the shell had basically withered away. And um, there are oyster farmers on the shores of the Puget Sound in Washington State who now report that the shells of their baby oysters and their hatcheries are literally dissolving. And they're now trying to figure out, you know, engineering works around to keep their five generation family business of oyster farming alive. Um, you know, you could argue that the oceans are really the um, fundament to the global kind of food chain. And so, um, you know, if pteropods and um, other minute ocean organisms start to dissolve, I think we could really see calamitous impacts. So, you know, in general, the scientific community um, is in agreement that on this issue, we are tipping on the verge of catastrophe. And the good news is um, we actually still have a window to avert the worst impacts. I feel like I'm watching everybody's body language just go like, oh, God, it's hopeless. Um, hope is not lost. So there is still time to avert the worst impacts of global warming, but the window is closing. We have to act boldly and we have to act swiftly. So let me talk a little bit about how we actually go about averting the worst impacts. Um, at the last international climate conference in Copenhagen when world leaders came together in 2009, um, there was consensus that if we allow our planet to warm on average two degrees Celsius, that's too much. We have to keep the warming to two degrees Celsius worldwide. Um, and so then the question is, how do you actually go about keeping warming to two degrees Celsius? This is cool, right? I'm 20 minutes into my talk and this is the first graph. Are you like happy? Okay. Um, so basically what I want to illustrate with this graph is what level of carbon dioxide can we allow to go into the atmosphere in order to keep warming to two degrees Celsius? So down here on the abscissa or x-axis, you'll see the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere measured in parts per million. And on the ordinate axis, or y-axis, you can see the likelihood that we'll be able to keep warming below 2 degrees Celsius at that level of carbon dioxide. Heads nodding. I see one head nodding. People following? Okay, great. So um, the basic consensus 
is that we have a, a pretty good, a medium likelihood of keeping warming to two degrees Celsius at about 450 parts per million of carbon dioxide. If we allow carbon dioxide to go to 500 parts per million, you know, the percentages decrease. Like we're basically more than 50% that it's gonna exceed two degrees Celsius in warming. And an even safer bet is to keep it more in the 400 parts per million range. Histor just so you know, kind of pre-industrial levels of carbon dioxide are around 315 parts per million. Um, so a troubling thing is that we um, hit 400 parts per million in April of this past year. Um, there's an observatory at uh, a research lab at Mauna Loa in Hawaii. Um, and, um, you know, in April was the first time that we ever had 400 parts per million, and now we're consistently exceeding 400 parts per million for atmospheric CO2 levels. So, um, you know, we have, we have a lot of work to do to make sure that we don't cross that line. Okay, so what do we need to do if we actually want to keep atmospheric CO2 levels to 450 parts per million? Number one is we have to halt the growth of emissions this decade. Carbon dioxide is incredibly long-lived in the atmosphere, and so any emissions that we release now are around for a long time. So we have to cap our emissions this decade. What is it now? It's 2015. We have five years to cap emissions. No more growth. We actually have to reduce emissions very soon. And then by 2050, we have to slash our emissions of carbon dioxide worldwide by more than half. The United States absolutely has to lead in this effort. We are the second largest emitter of carbon dioxide in the world behind only China, which surpassed us a couple of years ago. But historically, we've emitted more carbon dioxide than any other country. We have an obligation to try to fix this problem. And then we are undisputedly the world leader. So if the United States takes action, other states will follow. Um, and, you know, the reality is, in the past, other nations have been leading on this, right? A lot of um, other nation states signed on to the Kyoto Protocol, actually put in place um, plans to curb emissions. We have to get on board with that, and in fact, we have to leapfrog over it. Um, another reason why, from kind of my organization's perspective, we have to get the U.S. to lead is this is our democracy, right? We can't control what Uganda does. We can't control what Russia does. But in this country, we actually have democratic structures in place that theoretically should do what the people call for. Um, so even though our democracy is imperfect, imperfect, we actually do have vehicles to change policy here in this country that we wouldn't in a dictatorial government, for example. Okay, so how do we get the U.S. to lead? What's the pathway? Um, this figure uh, was put together by the World Resources Institute um, in a study they released in 2014, and it basically shows the pathway to getting to the reductions that we need. Um, so let me explain this figure. Um, on the x-axis down here um, is time, starting in 2008, and progressing to 2035. And then on the y-axis is the amount of carbon emitted um, in the United States alone, measured in millions of tons of carbon dioxide. So um, up here, I'm gonna use a laser pointer. Up here you can see our historic emissions, 2008 going to 2012. And then this orange line represents the emissions reduction trajectory called for by the science. If we wanna keep warming to two degrees Celsius and get to 450 parts per million, these are the emission reductions that we need to see. Some key benchmarks along the road are, by 2020, we need to have a 15 to 20% reduction. So 17% is kind of in the middle of that range. And by 2050, we have to have an 80 to 95% reduction compared to 1990 baseline levels. So here, that's put at 83%. All 
All right, so that's the orange line. The orange line is what science says we need in order to keep global warming to two degrees Celsius. These gray lines up here are different scenarios that we know are currently technically feasible and also allowed under the current regulatory framework. No new congressional action would be needed to accomplish any of these other lines. So if we do business as usual, this top curve, that means no additional regulatory action, um, no strong enforcement, we just keep doing with what we have now. And then we could go lackluster, we could go middle of the road, or we could go big and bold, the go-getter approach. The go-getter approach means we are doing basically everything we can that we currently have the authority to do. Um, you'll see that even the go-getter approach doesn't actually get us all the way where science says we need to go. So we actually need new regulatory authority, um, and we'll probably need some improvements in technology as well. And the cool thing is, like, both those things are, I don't know, I feel like um, they're like primed um, to happen. Okay, so what is, you know, we're trying to get the US to be a go-getter. Um, and that's what we're, you know, as a kind of as an organization who's working to solve this problem, um, part of what we want to do first is make sure we actually understand the problem. And so the first thing you need to do is figure out where are these emissions actually coming from? Um, so this right here is a pie chart courtesy of the Environmental Protection Agency that shows the you know, emissions of carbon dioxide in the United States by sector. So um, over here is the electricity sector, and basically that means power plants. This um, is the single largest source of carbon pollution in our society today. And coal-fired power plants are by far the biggest contributor here, although natural gas-fired power plants certainly play a role too. So how do you go about tackling that first biggest wedge of carbon emissions? We can become more efficient. We can invest in clean energy. We can put caps on global warming pollution from power plants. We can put caps on global warming pollution economy-wide, so kind of addressing the whole pie chart at once. And then there's a whole lot more that we can do. When it comes to efficiency, this is the single cheapest, fastest, cleanest, best way to reduce carbon emissions. This should absolutely be the first fuel that we look to. Um, and in the United States, 75% of energy coming from power plants is used on buildings. It's used for heating, it's used for lighting, it's used for laptops, it's used for appliances, et cetera. So um, we've actually set a goal of making sure that every building um, in the United States by 2030, um, new construction, um, produces as much energy on site as it uses, this concept of net zero energy. Um, and then we absolutely need to go back and retrofit our existing buildings to make sure that they're using as little energy as possible. Um, and it's been very fun walking around Dowling Hall and you know, I'll go to the restroom and I'll come back and the light in the office where I'm doing interviews is off and I'll walk in and the motion sensor will turn the light on. Those are, you know, that's existing technology that we have now that should just be standard in all of our industrial and commercial buildings. Okay, not to mention residences. I would love that in my house. Um, so that's efficiency. Clean energy is the next thing. Wind power is, um, you know, it's on an upward trajectory in our country. We power 17 million homes right now using the power of the wind, um, and we're only scratching the surface. You know, there's enough wind that blows over four states to power literally the entire country. I'm not necessarily saying that we should blanket South Dakota in wind turbines and then build huge transmission lines, but what I am saying is that there's just a lot more that we could do to harness the power of the wind. Solar power, totally growing by leaps and bounds. The amount of um, energy that we're getting from the sun in the United States has tripled over two years. That's huge. Um, and the costs are down 50% compared to 2011. Um, in fact, in 14 states now, it is cheaper to buy your energy from solar than it is traditional energy sources. Um, and Massachusetts is totally leading the way with this. We are um, third in the country in terms of the installed solar um, per capita last year alone. And I'll tell a little bit more about that later. All right, so 
energy efficiency, clean energy, those are kind of like no-brainers. We can all wrap our heads around that and envision that. Um, something that's a little bit less visible but equally important is actually capping carbon emissions from power plants. So um, this idea first emerged in the late 90s. And um, at that time, I remember it was a, it was a big deal because um, you know, this was the era when acid rain was kind of a big issue and smog pollution and asthma was a big issue. And so we ran a campaign in Massachusetts called the Filthy Five. We were working to clean up the Filthy Five dirtiest power plants in the state. And we were looking to address um, mercury emissions, right? Mercury, neurotoxin, totally bad for developing kids. One in six women of childbearing age has so much mercury in their body it can harm their unborn child. Scary stuff. Mercury is bad. So we were capping mercury. We were capping sulfur dioxide, which causes soot. We were capping smog, um, nitrogen oxides. And then the fourth pollutant that we snuck in um, was carbon dioxide. It was the first time ever in the history of the country that carbon dioxide was regulated as a pollutant. And Massachusetts was the place where it happened. Um, so that happened in the year 2000. And then um, five years after that, Massachusetts, under the leadership of Governor Mitt Romney, partnered with Canadian premiers to create the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And this is an interstate compact that puts a price on carbon, sets targets for reducing carbon emissions, and then uses money by selling the carbon from the power plants, the credits, to create um, funding for energy efficiency and clean energy programs. This program has been wildly successful. It's created more than a billion dollars of investment in energy efficiency and clean energy in this region alone. Um, and we have done a lot of work over the years, not only to uh, put REGI in place, but to defend it in states where uh, there was an effort to pull out of the program, um, and then in the three-year reviews to actually strengthen the program and ramp up the caps. Totally cool stuff. Um, okay, so that's kind of some of the policies being used to ratchet down the emissions from the electric sector. The next major piece of the pie, right, like if you imagine this is a pizza, if this is the next piece of the pie you want to shrink, is transportation. So um, this is cars, trucks. And the key things that we can do to reduce emissions from transportation are, number one, just get cars to literally go further on a gallon of gas, right? Second thing we can do is let's just scrap the internal combustion engine altogether and let's convert to electric vehicles. And then if those electric vehicles are powered by solar panels, all of a sudden you have a clean car. Um, and then the third thing under transportation is we actually have to restructure our communities in a way that makes it so that people don't have to get in a car at all. So that means we need to create bike bikeable communities, walkable communities, um, you know, more uh, and better um, public transportation options that people actually want to take. Um, and we have to, you know, get serious about building that kind of infrastructure and that kind of society. Is it me or is it hot in here? It's hot in here, yeah. Um, okay, so on getting cars to go further on a gallon of gas, um, in 12 states, for a number of years, Environment America Group's top campaigns um, were our clean cars campaigns. And we actually, um, in those 12 states, improved the fuel economy standards. Um, California led the way, Massachusetts was second, and then a whole bunch of other states followed suit. Um, electric vehicles I already talked about. This is like the next big thing that's going to take off. So um, here in New England, um, I feel like I'm seeing more and more electric vehicles and more infrastructure. And the New England governors have actually agreed to um, doing some pretty serious investment in EV infrastructure. Um, and then in California, we're running a big campaign through our sister group, Environment California, called Charge Ahead. And the goal of that campaign is to get a million electric vehicles on the road. If we can succeed in that, um, I mean, to see these California is literally the sixth largest economy in the world, that state alone. It has incredible market power. So if you can get California to go big on something, um, whatever technology is going to go from cottage to scale, and the prices will drop, um, and you know, it'll just be much easier to expand to the rest of the country. And the politics in California also lend themselves to these kinds of campaigns. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing on electric vehicles. 
So we're doing lots of great work, a lot of really good stuff happening in leadership states like Massachusetts. Um, but up until 2008, there really wasn't any meaningful federal action to deal with global warming pollution. And again, the science is there, the window is closing, we definitely need that. So in 2008, there was really new opportunity. Barack Obama knew that global warming was a problem, he wanted to do something about it. And in fact, three months after coming into office, those um, clean car standards that we passed in 12 states, President Obama took and made the national standard. Um, I think it's just a really great example of how state level leadership can help drive national policy. Um, and then President Obama actually went above and beyond that three years later and the new uh, corporate ad average fuel economy standard right now is um, that on average every car manufacturer's fleet has to get 54.5 miles per gallon by 2025. Um, this is another key driver for electric vehicles on the national level. What's that? You're laughing at my pun of using driving. <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay, so good stuff happening on the transportation sector. And, um, you know, just to flash back to 2008, um, you know, the environmental community really saw an opportunity here. We had a president who believed that global warming was something that he needed to work on. We had um, Democrats in control of the House and the Senate for the first time in years. And the leadership of, you know, all the environmental community groups in Washington, D.C. got together and said, you know, if there is ever a time to pass a climate bill, this is it. Um, and so we, you know, found some sponsors in uh, Senator Markey and Representative Waxman. Speaker Pelosi did a bunch of work to move it forward. Um, and a climate bill was introduced and it passed the House of Representatives. And then, um, you know, a ton of momentum leading up to the Senate vote, vote counting going on like crazy, tons of field work happening in key swing states. And then in February of 2010, um, an unfortunate snowstorm happened. And the week of the vote, a couple of representatives who were our yes votes got stranded in their home state. Um, the climate deniers used the snowstorm dubbed Snowmageddon in Washington, D.C. as a reason to show that, you know, our planet isn't actually warming and we ended up losing um, the vote in the Senate and the National Climate Bill failed. A um, couple months later, the Republican, you know, kind of in a right wing move, the Tea Party um, efforts, uh, the House of Representatives flipped to Republican control and we basically, you know, the the window for passing national climate legislation through Congress had basically closed. So um, this comes back to kind of one of the other things that I think makes us unique is that we just never give up. So we lost the climate bill, we're kind of looking our, licking our wounds, um, but then pretty quickly um, figured out a new strategy. And our national director, Margie Alt, pulled together the leadership of all the other green groups to try to figure out a new path forward. And um, the one kind of key thing that we could agree on um, was that we should take the carbon cap on power plants that states like Massachusetts had passed and try to make that policy nationwide. And so we launched that campaign in 2011. Um, to this day, it's the largest coalition collaborative effort in the history of the environmental community. Um, it's called the Climate Action Campaign, which Environment America chairs in partnership with NRDC. Um, and, um, you know, rather than framing the issue as a green jobs issue or a, um, you know, kind of secure national security issue, uh, climate is front and center. So, you know, hashtag act on climate is really the banner that this campaign is operating under. Um, and after two years of lots of field organizing and advocacy work, President Obama <clears throat> proposed um, what is now known as the Clean Power Plan. The New York Times called this plan the single largest action ever taken by a U.S. president on climate change. It is a big deal. Our 500 coal-fired power plants in this country produce as much carbon pollution 
as the entire economy of India. And this proposal will reduce emissions from those plants 32 percent by 2030. So imagine that pie, 37 percent of the electric sector, and you basically shrink it um, by a third. So it's a big step. It's not, it certainly doesn't solve the problem, but it's a huge, huge step. Um, and under this rule, the EPA will set the targets and then the states will make the plans. So um, opposition to this plan came out hard and furious. Um, the coal industry, you know, I mean, running ads, billboards in West Virginia calling President Obama a jobs killer, um, anti-regulatory ideologues just coming out guns blazing. Um, you've got Senator Inhofe from Oklahoma bringing a snowball onto the floor of the Senate floor, proving that global warming isn't happening because there's snow. Um, this is the same guy who said that global warming is, quote, the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on the American people. Um, so, you know, just a ton of opposition, both in Washington, D.C., um, and out in the states. And, um, you know, the community as a whole just did a tremendous, tremendous amount of work to build up the support that the Obama administration needed to keep moving forward in the face of that opposition. Um, so just to give you a sense, this right here, um, this is our Global Warming Program Director, Julian Boggs, and um, together with our team is holding um, what is the eight, million, eight millionth public comment in support of the Clean Power Plan. Um, more public comments were collected on the Clean Power Plan than any other environmental issue ever in the history of EPA. Just huge amount of grassroots organizing to collect all those public comments. Um, our organization alone organized more than 390 public events like round tables, you know, with clean energy businesses or news conferences, standing with local elected officials. Um, and, you know, these events helped generate uh, close to 800 media hits in an 18 month period alone, uh, you know, supporting the plan and, you know, emboldening the administration to keep moving forward, even though they're totally getting hammered. Um, and then this is Margie, she's our executive director, and this is Gina McCarthy, the administrator of the EPA. Um, it's helpful that Gina McCarthy also believes that global warming is a really important issue that needs action. She was um, an administrator in Massachusetts for a long time and was really the architect behind the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. So she understands the mechanics of how caps on carbon emissions work, and she actually believes that we can take the model that Massachusetts helped develop and that these nine states are doing and take it nationwide. Um, so Margie and Gina were on the phone quite a bit. You know, Mar Gina would tell Margie where they're feeling the pressure, what kind of response is needed, and then Margie would help deploy the field resources to help make that happen. And we won. So in August of this year, President Obama finalized the Clean Power Plan. It's moving forward. Um, but the opposition also continues. So, um, you know, 15 states led by the Coal State of West Virginia have now sued EPA, claiming that the Clean Power Plan is illegal. Um, so certainly kind of lawsuits are uh, ensuing. Um, but at the same time, um, the implementation of the Clean Power Plan is moving forward. And a bunch of states are now, you know, looking to Massachusetts and other states that have already capped emissions to figure out how they can come up with their plans. Um, leader states definitely need to keep leading. Right, just um, two weeks ago, California passed legislation uh, so that they get 50% of their electricity from clean renewable sources by 2030. Huge, huge development. Here in Massachusetts, we're trying to get Governor Baker to commit to a goal of getting um, a fifth of our energy from the sun by 2025. Um, so we have to make sure that states like Massachusetts keep pushing the envelope because that's what's gonna embolden the next um, phase of federal action. And then, you know, this December is a huge, huge benchmark. It's the next time that world leaders are going to come together to try to hammer out the details of a binding international climate agreement. And when I think back to that timeline of when action is needed by, you know, the Paris climate negotiations are kind of do or die. Um, we have to get real meaningful action out of those negotiations, and the United States needs to lead. Um, so I'll close 
the section on global warming by just um, quoting Pope Francis. He says, the time for seeking global warming solutions is running out. We can find suitable solutions only if we act together and in agreement. So if you are interested in, you know, doing this kind of work, um, working on these kinds of campaigns, um, I encourage you to check out Environment America. We have internship programs in Washington, D.C. and in the 29 states. Our um, state director here in Massachusetts, Ben Hellerstein, is truly one of the best intern managers that I've ever seen. Um, like, he's just great to work with. So, you know, if you want to find something for the winter or the spring, Ben is great. Um, and thanks so much for the time and for the opportunity. Ah, oh, shoot. Okay, we have time for one question. In the back, red. Yeah. Great. So the question is a messaging question. Why do we use the term global warming as opposed to climate change? Um, we've spent a lot of time going back and forth on this issue, and ultimately, um, we've decided that global warming, A, is much more active than climate change is. So it implies that something is happening. It's not a passive process. Um, and then number two is it, we feel like it more accurately describes what's actually happening with our global climate. Our climate is warming. That's the problem. And so that's why we use that language. One other question. Um, do I still have meeting appointments available? I honestly don't know. Where's Jim? I don't think I do, but I'm right here. So email me or call me. I'm honestly happy to talk and happy to give career advice. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs>